So I do want to thank the sponsors of our University Express program, my Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans, because without them, this program would not be possible. I um, want to let you know that we're here for you at Senior Services. If you have any questions or need any help, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We're at 858-8526. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Philip Stevens to you. Philip Stevens Jr. recently retired after 48 years in the anthropology department at UB. He received his BA in English from Yale in 1963, then went to Nigeria with the Peace Corps to teach English and to work with the Nigerian government's Department of Antiquities to document, repair, and protect the famous stone images of SEA. Those experiences brought him into anthropology and he entered the graduate program at Northwestern University. He conducted dissertation research in different areas of Nigeria from 1969 to 1971 and received his PhD in 1973. He has conducted subsequent anthropological research in West Africa and the Caribbean. He is the author of many publications in cultural anthropology and African studies, and he is the recipient of two awards for excellence in teaching. One of his most popular courses at UB was an anthropology of magic, sorcery, and witchcraft. He's now writing a book on that topic. I'm going to turn it over to him, and hopefully the sound pulls through. So thank you for your patience, everybody. Thank you, Katie. And uh, anyone who has difficulty hearing me, please tell Katie, and she'll tell me. Uh, th this is terrific. Uh, as Katie said, I retired from UB last year, 2019, and I immediately rejoined uh, University Express, which I had participated in some years earlier. Uh, and Katie was then the coordinator. She ran a terrific program last year and in the fall of 2019, which I participated in. And when she asked me this spring to, to do some uh, online programs instead of the in-person programs that we had planned, uh, I was delighted. Uh, I want to commend her, and I want to remind everybody, in case you need reminding, what a terrific service the um, Department of Senior Services provides for the citizens of, of Erie County. I haven't lived for very long in other counties, and certainly not as a senior citizen, but what I've seen here is absolutely terrific. And I, I've conducted a number of these classes in senior uh, uh, centers in various villages in Erie County, and, and Katie has coordinated them all. Um, and I just think it's a terrific service. So I'm gonna talk to you today about some universals uh, in human culture. Uh, I hope uh, it will be, uh, interesting and a learning experience for you. Uh, I hope you will have some new views on what superstitions are uh, from an anthropological perspective, which I'm pretty sure will be new to you. Um, my email address is here and my, my um, cell phone is here. I invite you to, re to make note of, of those and contact me with any questions you have. I know that uh, this program is being recorded so that you can log on to um, the uh, uh, Erie County website. Uh, Katie has given us that, she'll get, give it to us again. Uh, and you can listen to this whole program again. I can send you any of the slides. Um, if I, I will speak uh, slowly and clearly, but we have a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to move right along. We'll stop periodically, and I'll ask Katie if she's received questions. Um, so if you have questions, write them down when they occur to you. Don't try to hold on to them. Send them in to Katie. She'll keep them, and when I stop, she'll present them to me. At the end of the program, or toward the end, I'm going to ask you if you have any superstitions that uh, we're going to cover a lot of them, but some you may have that we haven't talked about that you'd like to suggest 
and see if we can analyze them according to the principles of magical thinking that I'm going to present to you today. So we first have to talk about our key terms. What is a superstition and what, what are the implications of the word itself? Um, I copied this uh, definition from my desk, uh, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. Um, I want to point out to you that the word itself is loaded and it has an attitude. Uh, it comes from two Latin words, super, which means above or higher, and stitio, a standing point, from sto, stare, to the verb to stand, literally to stand, as well as figuratively to, to, to uh, be in a place. It means that you have a better explanation. It means that you have a superior uh, um, viewpoint. So the term itself is a put down. Uh, it's belittling the uh, uh, its referent. So I want everyone to be aware of that. We're not going to change our language. We're going to continue to use the term, but I just want to be um, clear on what it means. Um, many, if not all, of superstitions that we will discuss today anyway, are examples of, of what I'm calling magical thinking. Uh, following what I'm arguing in, uh, in, in my book that Katie talked about, uh, are universal principles of thinking, universal ways in which people construct and explain their world. Um, magic is the other term we need an explanation for before we get started. I, over the years of, of teaching the course that Katie mentioned, Magic, Sorcery, and Witchcraft at the University of Buffalo, I've come up with a whole list of meanings of this word. It's really a loaded term with, with many different meanings. Um, you can read this quickly. I'm not going to go through all of these for you. Um, it's not in any in, uh, necessary order, except I think the first ones are probably the most, the most common meanings of, of the term. Uh, and we're going to jump down to the bottom. Um, the phrase sympathetic magic, uh, which leads us into the anthropological meaning. The English word refers to a way of thinking that is absolutely universal with no exceptions whatsoever. This is one of those um, few a handful of, of human concepts that we can argue are completely universal, found in among all peoples uh, everywhere in the world uh, and in throughout recorded history. Um, what we mean by magic depends on six principles, and I want to go through them all, and then we'll have some illustrations uh, of them as we go along. The first is really the essence of religion itself, the concept of supernatural power. Now, I'm talking about supernatural power here. I'm not talking about physical power or uh, political charisma. I'm talking about a belief in a, an energy that has strength uh, in the world. Um, uh, God has most of it. Uh, spirits have some of it. Uh, all living things have a little bit. But nature is filled with it, and um, magic and magical thinking depend upon the concept of power that energizes uh, things in the world. Um, everybody in the world believes in something like what I'm describing here with my second principle, forces. It's the best word I have. Um, these are engines. These are little energy cells that are in everything. They themselves have power and they make things happen in the world. Um, people believe that the forces of nature are programmed to operate from the great creation and they have been operating ever since. Um, sometimes they operate individually. Sometimes they require assistance from others. 
the forces of nature are inherently good. They do things uh, that are necessary for nature to, to uh, operate successfully and everything in it at the same time. We'll come back to the concept of forces. Um, all cultures believe in them. In some cultures, they are named, um, but they are all recognized. And I argue in my book that they really ought to be considered one of the fundamental principles of, of religion. Um, we talk about uh, spirits and ghosts and, and gods and demons. We ought to also talk about forces. When you pray to God for a successful harvest, what you're doing is asking God to energize the forces that control the harvest, the forces that um, promote the growth of the seeds and the growth of the plant and the um, uh, energy that, uh, that it takes to harvest and so on and so on and so on. Uh, magic is the belief that people can do it themselves directly without invoking spiritual uh, assistance. Uh, magical thinking requires a concept of interconnections among all things in the world, all things that have ever been, all things that are right now, and all things that are yet to occur. And it, according to this principle of an interconnected universe, which is another um, example of universal thinking, all things in the world are potentially if not act actually interconnected by, uh, we might say, invisible threads or invisible uh, pathways. Uh, magic activates those potential interconnections. It makes them real, it makes them active, and it, it, it establishes a pathway or a channel through which the forces uh, can move. Um, between the actor and the uh, recipient of the action. Mag uh, magic requires symbolic thinking. Um, symbols are a fundamental concept in cultural anthropology. And one of these few things that distinguishes people from all other animals. Um, we know that the most advanced primates, um, chimpanzees, bonobos, and others, uh, have an incipient, uh, a beginning uh, be uh, ability to, to uh, allow something to stand for something else. But in, in people, the symbol takes on special characteristics. Um, the symbol not only stands for, represents the thing that it sorry, not only stands for or represents something else, the symbol can take the place of the thing it represents. So the symbol can be the active representation of the thing it represents. The thing it represents can be a, a person, an object, or, or, uh, or uh, an action. The symbol takes the place of that thing. It takes on the characteristics of, this, of the thing it represents. And if the thing the symbol represents has power, then the symbol itself becomes powerful. A good example of this is a, is a religious icon like the cross. And throughout the history of Christianity, people have believed that the cross, just a, a, the, one of the most simple of all uh, international religious symbols, the cross itself can become powerful. It takes on the power of what it represents. The end of the 19th century, a great, a great British folklorist, uh, George Fraser, who was uh, James George Fraser, who was knighted by Queen Victoria for his productivity, um, is credited with having described the principles of sympathetic magic, which we still use today. Um, in the late 19, uh, 1890s, he began work on his major book called The Golden Bow, B-O-U-G-H. And by, uh, oh, 15 years later, by, by 1910, The Golden Bow 
was 10 volumes long. From 1910 to the present, it has been condensed as much of what he said was found to be faulty and was deleted, but his principles of magic have, have stayed to the present. Fraser said that magic, um, nearly all actions and concepts that we can call magical depend on two fundamental principles. Um, principles of similarity, things that resemble other things have a causal relationship with those other things. Now that resemblance can be in many different uh, concepts, uh, form, shape, sound, odor, color, um, things that resemble something else in any way can uh, have a causal relationship. So if you have a symbol that represents something else and the symbol has some of the elements of the thing it represents, uh, then the symbol can, can act in concert with, in sympathy with the thing it represents. And you can take a, make an action on the symbol and the referent of the symbol will be uh, affected. The magic is more powerful if the symbol or the material you're using has been in direct physical contact with the thing that you're trying to activate. This is the principle of contagion, contagious magic. And this too is, is absolutely universal. People everywhere believe that things that have been in contact with other things leave something of themselves in that other thing. If the thing has power, they leave something of the power in the other thing. If the thing has its own unique personality or essence, something of that essence is left in the other thing that it's been in contact with, even when that contact is separated. Shall we stop here, Katie, and see if there are any questions? Okay, hopefully there's not much feedback. Um, we do have a question. Can you give some examples about contagion magic? Yes, I will as the, as the, talk, as the talk goes on. Anything else? Okay, that's okay. all so far. So those are the six principles. Not all of them will be evident in every case, but some will. Um, and I'm an anthropologist. I've been studying this stuff for many decades now. Uh, if you talk to people who admit that they are superstitious, they probably will not be able to explain their superstition in these terms. Um, um, and for most people in the world, uh, these are kind of vague uh, assumptions. But I don't think anyone will argue with these uh, any of these six principles as being present. Now, magic is all pervasive. It is not separate from religion. It intertwines with religion. And there are many um, active uh, uh, rituals and concepts in religion that operate according to some of the principles of magic. Let's go through some of them first. The act of magic itself. You want something to happen, so you act out that thing. Sorry for my phone. I'll disconnect it. Hold on a minute. Now, I guess it's not going to disconnect. Let it run down. Um, and magic uh, can be for good or for harm. Uh, most acts of magic are are to improve what the forces of nature uh, are set out to do. And they are open and public good magic. So you want to improve your harvest. So you uh, activate something that promotes fertility, for example, uh, like a mystical fertilizer of, of, of the soil. But 
if you want to use magical principles to cause the forces of nature to do something they were not programmed to do, to cause them to deviate from their course, then this is dangerous. This is risky. And this gets us into sorcery. My second uh, item, item here, sorcery is negative magic. Sorcery is magic performed for personal gain, which deprives someone else, or magic performed to do, do direct harm to someone else. Those are both contrary to nature. Uh, they are dangerous because they are deflecting the forces, causing them to do things they were not programmed to do. Uh, and that requires incredible skill on the part of the sorcerer. Uh, it's an unpredictable act, people believe. It's a dangerous act. The forces of nature can be deflected and run off in, in dangerous directions. They, the sorcerer could lose control of them. Uh, and uh, therefore, sorcery is always clandestine. It is always hidden. It is always spoken about, but rarely uh, demonstrated. It is most commonly suspected rather than actually practiced. Uh, it is severely feared all over the world. Uh, sorcery, the use of magic, using objects and words to influence the forces of nature is a universal belief and a universal practice. It requires no special gift on the part of the practitioner. Anyone can, can learn how to do it. Um, the most common example of sorcery is image magic, what has sometimes been called a voodoo doll, although it's, there is no relation to voodoo. That's a misnomer. Um, the, the idea that you want to do harm to somebody else, you make an image of the person um, representing the person, resembling the person in some way. And it is really powerful if you can take a piece of cloth from that person's clothing or especially something that's been in very close contact like that person's underwear and work that into your image. Then you do, you do something harmful to the image. You utter words. Words are symbols. Words contain the very power of what they represent, um, and words can uh, influence the forces of nature. And uh, you hope that the the what you're trying to affect will will happen. Blessing and curse are examples of magical uses of words. When we ask God to bless us, we are invoking God and asking Him to do it. But if I say to you, "Have a nice day." That is a blessing. Uh, the words are going from me directly to you. They are good words. You like to hear them. And maybe because words everywhere have power, maybe they will help. And maybe you really will have a nice day. If I'm angry with you, really, really angry, and I, I might say, go to hell, um, that's really bad. Uh, if I say, um, please forgive me, everyone, this, I'm an anthropologist here. If I say, God damn you, then I am invoking God to condemn you to eternal hellfire, to, to eternal suffering. That's really, really terrible. And it violates that fundamental commandment that God set down to all his people, that you should not take the name of the Lord in that type, that level of, of vanity. But if I say go to hell, I'm not calling on God. I'm, I'm using the words directly. Um, if I say, may you uh, have a difficult time with your examination uh, uh, tomorrow, that's the negative use of words. And the words, unless they are counteracted or withdrawn by me, can go on and uh, and cause the unfortunate things that they embody. That is a curse. Taboo is the avoidance of, you, of establishing a magical connection. The idea that, that magic, uh, a magical act might cause some harm or might bring into our presence something really powerful that might be too strong for us to, to uh, tolerate. The word comes from the South, South Pacific, uh, from Polynesia and Melanesia. 
uh, and it was applied first to the kings of Polynesia, um, among other uh, examples. The king was a powerful person. He had so much power that he was elevated. He was separated from his subjects. Uh, he, people did not even walk on the ground where he was walking. Uh, when he was carried, care was taken so that his shadow did not pass over uh, the people on the side of the road because the shadow was an extension of himself. Uh, so the king's person was taboo, meaning having a, a dangerous power uh, in it and to be uh, avoided. Uh, the concept of taboo is uh, evident in the concepts of, of purity in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. Go to the book of Leviticus, for example, and look at all the forbidden acts um, many uh, mystical connections that are that are forbidden. Uh, you should not touch food that a leper has touched. A, a menstruating woman must not prepare food. Uh, no uh, a person must sit on the chair that a menstruating woman has sat upon until evening, and so on and so on and so on. Many, many of them. These are taboo acts. Uh, meaning they, they involve a transfer of power, which is somehow undesirable. Divination is based on finding out information that is, that is rooted or vested in that interconnected uh, universe that we talked about. Uh, everything that has happened in the world, uh, everything that is happening right now somewhere else, and everything that is yet to happen is somehow programmed into the cosmos, so a lot of people believe. And divination is a means of releasing that information. Uh, it works by magical principles, uh, by words, and by uh, uh, symbols. And finally, magical protection. All of these magical items, like the cross or the Star of David, that have power, can be used individually to protect um, people against some sources of evil, some sources of harm. And again, we are talking about mystical uh, activity influencing, influencing the forces of nature. We are not talking about invoking spirits, spiritual uh, beings. People say forces, yeah, there are natural forces in the world. Uh, and the fact that there are natural forces that are measurable by science uh, contributes to the belief that there are mystical forces operating that science just hasn't been able to measure yet. Uh, like the concept of psychic energy. There are a lot of people who believe that they can project their thought waves they can project intentions uh, through space and influence uh, uh, things and actions somewhere else, or that they can determine um, information that exists somewhere else by psychic means. Um, and we can't prove or disprove such claims. Uh, my, I will fall back on one of the fundamental principles of science that what we're talking about must be measurable. So we know about light energy, we know about radiation and microwaves. Those are common invisible uh, forces that we deal with uh, throughout our days. Um, there are other invisible forces uh, without which the world that we know could not operate, gravity. Um, uh, electromagnetism, the weak and strong nuclear forces. There are some others. If you're interested in astrophysics, um, you, will have, you will have encountered the terms spooky action or quantitative entanglement. Uh, these are complicated. I have tried to understand them and I, and I don't. I encourage you to look them up yourselves. Um, the idea that things that happen in a great distance from us, light years away from us, can influence things that are happening here. Uh, it's, it's bizarre, it's, it's science fiction, but uh, nuclear, uh, sorry, astrophysics uh, is, is actually working on it. 
It, to me, it's about as comprehensive, uh, comprehensible as the idea of a black hole. Um, there will be others in uh, in in the sciences of physics uh, also. So it means that many of these cultural ideas uh, are based in a kind of logic. Uh, uh, they may not be measurable, but they certainly exist. Um, we we talk about in popular terms from new new age language. The word energy is widely used to indicate these kinds of forces that project uh, uh, through spaces, uh, through space, resonance, bioplasm, vibes uh, is another popular concept for it, a vital force, a life force, the essence of something. The biblical concept of glory is an example of power. Biblical power is sometimes visible when it's in concentrated form as it is in in uh, uh, um, in God, um, it can be fatal to people. Uh, go to uh, Exodus where Moses meets with God on top of the mountain and Moses demands to see God. And God says, uh, look, Moses, uh, no one can look upon me and live. And God puts Moses into a cave in a cleft in the rocks and God walks past and Moses sees the hem of God's robe. But when Moses comes down the mountain, he has been so close to God that his face is shining uh, and the people are terrified when he comes down. And every time he goes to talk to God in the, uh, after that, he wears a veil himself. This is the halo um, uh, that is depicted over the heads of saints in, in, in pictures to indicate this concentration of power, the aura that psychics are of claim to be able to detect, and psi energy. And these concepts in italics that I have, um, and this list could go on indefinitely, are examples of named um, power, named forces that exist in various cultures. Um, Bachama is a society where I worked in northeastern Nigeria, where I did my dissertation research. Their concept is called Fuato. Uh, you may be familiar with, with the Chinese concept of qi, um, or variant is qi in, in, uh, ja in Japanese, prana in, in yoga, and so on and so on and so on. There are belief that power flows in, through the earth uh, in streams and emerges in particular locations. Um, the concept of ley lines in Europe where the cathedrals of Europe are built or, or, or were um, places where, where powerful streams of power intersect. And those various places are very, very sacred places, uh, places where God is especially uh, present. If, you, if you're interested in feng shui, this uh, um, Chinese uh, divination system to organize your personal space. Uh, this is another example of, of, of organized cultural concepts of, of power uh, in nature. Shall I stop again, Katie? Yes, we have one question that came through. Um, does astrology fulfill the six magic principles? Good question, and I'm getting to it. <laughs> yeah. Please hang on to that one. Any others? Nope, no. that's it so far. This is so right. interesting. So, so I've, I've taken a lot of your time already to explain some of the fundamental principles of, of magic and magical thinking. My argument here, which is the basis of the book that I've been working on for 30 years, and I still am, these principles that I've described are innate. They are in our brains. They are in our system of thinking. They are found in all human cultures. Um, and keep in mind that all people everywhere are members of the same species. That means we are far more similar than we are different. That means that our biologies are similar everywhere. And our intellect, our brain functions are similar everywhere. 
this concept is lost uh, to many people today as we get all wrapped up in race. The idea of race implies human differences, but the differences are inconsequential. The differences are minor. We are all members of the same species. Um, some other scientists than myself have been testing these principles, especially similarity and contact. Um, I refer you to the recent discovery of the mirror neurons, uh, which is a major breakthrough in, in uh, neuro, the neurosciences going back to the 1980s. This enables us to detect resemblances in nature. Uh, and that's a new way of, ref of, of um, uh, expressing the potential of the mirror neurons, uh, if you are familiar with them. We can talk about that later if you'd like to. And the principle of, of contact have been studied for many years by two psychologists who you can look up. Paul Rosen from the University of Pennsylvania is now retired and his partner, Carol Nemiroff, who is at one of the University of Maine campuses is still uh, operating. And, and they have together conducted many experiments of, of the idea of contagion, that things that have been in touch with other things carry uh, the, uh, some of the element of that other thing with them, which may be good or it may not be good. Um, and uh, I urge you to look for, for them. You can look them up online. Uh, to explain magical thinking, um, most of our explanations in science are functionalist explanations. We tend to want to explain things in terms of what they do, how they function, what purpose they serve in our lives. And that may or may not explain the the uh, origin of the existence of the thing. Functions change and different things serve different functions for different people at different times. Um, so a functionalist explanation is good for that particular event under those particular conditions at that particular time. It may not be useful uh, for any other um, uh, uh, condition. Uh, but there is also a biological uh, explanation for magical thinking. As I have tried to suggest, the six principles of magical thinking that I have set down are absolutely universal. And when we find that something is universal, universal, that means all cultures of the world uh, display it, then we are justified in looking into the brain. We're justified in looking into our neurobiology for an explanation. Uh, and that's what I'm doing in my book. That's what um, the psychiatrists and, and neuroscientists are doing when they're investigating the, the biological um, basis for imitation. And that's what the psychologists, Rosen and Nemiroff, are doing, looking at uh, the principles of contagion. Magical thinking is natural. Therefore, superstition is natural and we needn't apologize for it. I'm gonna show you some slides to illustrate some of my principles. This is only partial. I don't know what happened to it, and I tried to get a replacement for it. This is the May 1st, 1988 cover of the New York Times Magazine, which shows a woman sitting inside of a collapsible pyramid made of aluminum tubes. Um, in New Age thinking, the, the pyramid is a structure designed to focus natural energy into a particular point. Uh, at least that's a, an explanation for the pyramid, right? And uh, she is sitting under one, which she hopes will energize her somehow, energize her general health, energize her brain power, uh, whatever she is looking for. So the new age, which is a term established back in the 1970s, early 1980s, from uh, the age of Aquarius, you know, and the term is still used, and I'm using it today to refer to various popular uh, magical beliefs. Uh, and I'm also gonna show you some beliefs from my, my own field work in West Africa and some objects from the Buffalo Museum of, of Science. Uh, colors are believed by 
um, modern New Agers uh, to have magical powers. Uh, and this is also very widespread around the world, perhaps not universal. The color red, I think, does have universal value. I think that the color red is a significant color in every culture in the world. And the easiest explanation for why that should be is because blood is red. And everyone recognizes that blood is life, and blood is vitality, and blood is critical. So red represents vitality, it represents energy, it represents also something really powerful and possibly destructive like fire. Uh, Satan uh, is depicted often uh, in, uh, in red. Um, and a, a candle uh, is a, is a you, has some universal uh, uh, util, some universal appeal. Uh, it directs an es an essence of whatever it's burning. It directs it upward, and most people believe that their that their gods, their supernatural powers are up above. Uh, they are they are uh, elevated. Colors are associated with various parts of the body in a variety of new age uh, healing systems. Um, colors are associated with beliefs that crystals, which formed under natural conditions, sometimes under great heat and great pressure. Um, uh, the world is filled with energy. The earth is filled with energy. The, the power, the pressure, the heat that created crystals has compressed that energy into little stones, that, little gems that you can carry with you. And the power in those crystals is enhanced by their color. Uh, and here's a, uh, an example of a belief in crystal healing, uh, going by the idea that different parts or different organs in the body respond to the energy in different colors. Um, people can effect uh, curing or at least improve bodily function by laying out uh, crystals. Someone asked earlier about astrology. Astrology is an ancient form of magical thinking. It, it, it's based on that fundamental principle that things in the universe are interconnected. There's probably no better example of that principle of interconnections in nature than the idea that we are influenced by cosmic forces, cosmic things, planets, and the uh, interrelationships of heavenly bodies, um, which are in particular conjunctions at the very moment that we are born, and they affect the balance of and the power of the various forces that are operating in the world when we come into the world. Um, I don't fully understand uh, astrology. This is Sigmund Freud's birth chart. I have no idea what it means, but if you're into astrology, um, this may give you a, a, a new perspective on it. Uh, it is magic. Um, the magi of the Christmas story were astrologers. They followed a star which only they could see. Uh, it was a conceptual star, right? Uh, and the science of astrology is even older than that. It's at least two or three thousand years older than the, than the time of of Jesus. It's a good example of of uh, magical thinking. You can go to New Orleans and have one of these made for you. This is a a mojo bag, M O J O, which comes from an African word. Um, uh, in New Orleans, it's called Grigri, G-R-I-S dash G-R-I-S. Uh, and for a good a good payment, uh, could be over a hundred bucks these days, you can have a mojo bag made for you. Um, the, uh, the voodoo uh, priest or priestess will question you, uh, go to the French Quarter. Uh, you could find such people uh, uh, very easily. They will ask you about your likes and dislikes and your friends and enemy enemies. And they may ask you when you were born and that kind of thing as well. And they'll put together a bag of magical items. Each one of these is has power. Um, I could explain all of them, but uh, no, I could explain some of them. 
Um, this, uh, this is the root of uh, St. John's wort. Uh, it resembles a, uh, a, a dried up male testicle. Um, uh, it's called High John or John the Conqueror. This is a St. Christopher uh, medal. Uh, it contains the power from the uh, Christian uh, icon. Um, such things will be put together in a red bag. The bag is red. Uh, and it's worn around your neck, under your clothing. Uh, it is you. It can't be used for anyone else. It contains all of the essences of you, or I should say symbolic representations of the essences of you, as determined by the priestess who made it for you. My fieldwork in Nigeria, in, in Bachama, in northeastern Nigeria from 1969 to 1971, um, the king, um, uh, who was a, uh, got to be a friend of mine, is entering the ritual ground at the at the um, be, at the. Uh, let's see. This is the end of the dry season uh, when the rains are ready. Uh, when it should uh, rain, that's around April or May, when the first rains fall, and everyone wants the rains to fall when they are supposed to fall. The king is wearing dark robes. In this picture, they look black, but in fact, they are deep indigo. Uh, and this is a sympathetic, magical signal to the cosmos to produce dark rain clouds. Throughout the rainy season, whenever the king appears in public, outside, in contact with the elements, he will wear these dark robes because the people want rain. They want the dark rain clouds. When the rain should end, which is September or October at the very latest, the king appears wearing pale blue robes. From then through the dry season uh, into the end of March and early April, whenever he appears in public, he will wear pale blue robes in sympathetic uh, expression of the wish, the collective wish for clear blue skies. Uh, the king embodies the wishes of, of, of the people. Um, in many cultures of the world, rain is absolutely critical. And if there's not enough rain when it's needed, there is certainly going to be a group of priests or other religious practitioners who plan to, who, who strive to control the rain. This is a rain charm from the Congo. Um, it, it is a hoop. Uh, held vertically like a basketball hoop. This is the handle of it right here. Uh, it is made of iron wrapped around with uh, fibers um, and hanging from it are little links of iron also wrapped very loosely with fibers. So you hold, hold this right here and you shake it and the links will tinkle together in a muted way and it sounds very much like rain falling through foliage. There are similar rain charms in South America. If you go to some of these craft stores like 10,000 Villages um, or go online and look for uh, items called rain shakers or rain sticks, you will find some of these items that are used or they're modeled after items that are used in South America. One of the most popular uh, from uh, Brazil uh, and from the uh, trop the forested areas of, of Peru um, is a large seed pod. It's a long seed pod, perhaps two feet long, that's allowed to, it's cut off a tree and it's allowed to dry. And when it dries, the, the little connections that hold the seeds inside will break. Uh, and when you hold it straight up, the seeds will fall down through the the lattice work that held it together held them together uh, to the bottom, you turn it over and let them fall through again. And the sound is like rain falling through foliage. This is a magical item designed to activate the forces of nature through the principle of similarity. It's widely used uh, in areas that depend upon rain. Another universal symbol is the horn, horned animals, uh, animals with 
horn-like protuberances in their heads, even the, um, the rhinoceros with one in its nose, uh, or deer with, with, little, with antlers. Uh, horned animals everywhere in the world are powerful. The horn is powerful. Probably the horn is a phallic symbol. Probably it's a symbol of male reproductive power. Um, probably. Um, and I think that this belief is, uh, explains the Chinese and other Asian desire for rhinoceros horn uh, in traditional medicines, and uh, which, uh, which has led to the decimation of rhinoceri in, in, uh, in, in East Africa. This is a, uh, a magical protective device made from a real uh, horn worn under the shirt. It's particularly uh, powerful against witchcraft. We're not talking about witchcraft today. That's a separate topic. It's a belief that there are psychic powers in certain people that can cause really, really serious harm to other people. Uh, and a horn um, uh, in Africa, and as we'll see later in parts of, of Europe, uh, is a protection against uh, witchcraft. The counterpart to the horn, which is a male item, is the cowrie shell, which represents the female uh, reproductive uh, organs. Cowries are powerful throughout Africa, throughout the Indian Ocean, where the African variety came from, and in medieval Europe. Uh, the underside of the cowrie represents the vulva. Um, the uh, un uh, human reproductive power is known everywhere. Uh, it's it's dangerous. It's the subject of many of the taboos, the violations of the purity laws in the book of Leviticus, uh, and the the little cowrie, which is used in jewelry, um, is derived from that belief. And here's an African mask, which combines both of these principles: the horns and the cowrie uh, shells, uh, as a powerful protector. Um, for its wearer. A, a, a soldier, a traditional soldier, is uh, wearing his armor, um, which is enhanced by real horns hanging from it and magical items hanging from the, from the hat. Horns are prescribed in the Bible in several different places. God tells Aaron, uh, Moses's brother, right? Aaron is the chief priest. How to construct the altar. And the altar shall have four horns. This is a horned altar from ancient Israel, uh, excavated and uh, the, the plaque uh, de uh, describing it. Um, the horns at, at the four corners of the altar enhance the power they direct power inward, and it's at the altar where things happen, right? Where the uh, sacrifice is transformed into uh, an essence that is believed to energize the gods. In the early 1980s, a horned altar was found in the hills of Judea. This picture comes from the magazine called Biblical Archaeology. Uh, you can't see it very well, but um, this is a solid hunk of rock out of which horn, a depression is carved and four horns uh, at, the, at the corners of, of, of the rock. It is a horned altar. You can look it up. Horned altar in the hills of Judea. Uh, you'll find it if you go to the uh, biblical archaeology website. The, the meaning of horns as protective devices worked its way into North African Islam. This is a private house in northern Nigeria. Um, this is uh, another one, the house of a fairly wealthy um, person. Those horns, those protuberances are not decorative, not only decorative, they also enhance uh, power. They protect the inhabitants of the house um, uh, from uh, evil. This is a view of the ancient city of Kano, K-A-N-O, in northern Nigeria, one of the major stops on the Trans-Saharan trade routes taken from the tower of the mosque. I took this in a long time ago in the 1960s. 
Um, why is a horseshoe lucky? This is a real question for all of you. I ask my students and they come up with all kinds of answers. You can't believe the number of answers. This is the way the horseshoe should be hung. If you put one over your doorway, it should be hung with the points upward. Does that give you a clue as to why it's lucky? Think about it. What does that horseshoe represent? Forget the fact that it was designed for a horse. Forget the fact that there are six or seven holes in it. For, forget the fact that it's made of metal, made of iron. The fact is it resembles horns. Really, that is the explanation. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the Bachama community of northeastern Nigeria, where I did my dissertation research, this house put up a poster. This is a house of Christians. Uh, an Easter celebration was being held the year before, and the celebration was called the Power of Christ's Blood. Um, this is a poster for it. Uh, uh, rain has washed out all of the uh, particulars on the poster, showing the place and the time and so on. But the words, Power of Christ's Blood, and the image of Christ on the cross uh, are so powerful that the owner of the house kept it on his wall. And he told me explicitly that it is invoking the power of Christ to protect that house. This is a magical act, taking power from one source and using it for some, some other. This you might re recognize, this is a, um, I forgot the name of it, it it's on the uh, door frame of a Jewish house. Uh, there's a name for it, you, you probably already thought of it. Um, um, and it, uh, the image of the Torah and, and so on. In these, uh, this dates from the first or second century of the modern era, um, uh, uh, BC, uh, uh, CE. In these depressions, there were four pieces of reflective mica, the mineral mica, which reflects. There's only one left, the others have fallen away. This was an evil eye charm, an evil eye repellent. If you coming to visit the house have the evil eye within you, uh, this item will reflect it uh, away. These are evil eye charms uh, found in mostly in Italy, but also in other areas. The manufica is the clenched fist with a thumb um, uh, between uh, the two first two fingers, what does that represent? Right, the same as what the cowrie shell represents. The fig hand and the fig uh, f becomes a euphemism for the uh, reproductive organs, which were covered up by fig leaves in the uh, late Middle Ages. These are little horns, um, cornuto. Um, uh, the horn is a powerful item. If the horn is shaped like a pepper, a pepper is powerful because it's uh, spicy, it's hot. Uh, uh, and if uh, a, a, an antler, a, a horn from an actual animal uh, is used, it, that contains not only the shape of the horn, but the power of the animal itself. These are evil eye charms worn on little, little necklaces around your neck to protect you from that inherent evil um, that is believed in around the Mediterranean basin. It's very similar to the evil of witchcraft. This is an Arab charm, um, the hand of Fatima for the same purpose. Um, the hand of Fatima uh, called in Hebrew the Kamsa uh, with, the, with the star of David. I think I'm uh, uh, running short on time. How am I doing, uh, uh, Katie? Can I keep going? Uh, please, by all means, people are do we engaged. Have, we have, do we some have questions. Um, um, actually, we we got started kind of late, didn't we? I, about fifteen more minutes. Um, the evil eye is a widespread belief in the Mediterranean and and Middle East. Um, it's a belief like witchcraft, uh, an evil power that is vested in certain people. Sometimes those people that have it don't even know that they have it. 
and it's projected through the gaze, through the direct gaze. Uh, so in, in most cultures, it's impolite to stare at someone. Um, and uh, if you're looking at something and you say how nice that is, uh, a suggestion that you are envious, a suggestion that that you are jealous, and you might activate that negative uh, power. And so the belief in the evil eye serves as a powerful deterrent against uh, a, 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 a social uh, behavior. Um, and this is an elaborate evil eye charm combining the Hamsa, the the uh, the Arab and is Israeli. Uh, emblem of the, the hand and the blue eye. Uh, blue is calming. We talked about the magical powers of colors early. Um, blue, especially pale blue, is calming. The sea and the blue sky are calming. The green of nature is calming. Uh, and the evil eye is active. It's hot. It's powerful. It, it, it can be calmed it can be reduced in its power by uh oh phil i think you're frozen okay oh phil are you there i'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry hold on i'm trying to come back all right, we're good. Yeah, can you still hear me? I can hear you, yes. This is just showing how technology doesn't want to cooperate sometimes. It's all good. No, it's my fault. I hit the wrong thing. Here we are. Are you are are you are you with me? Am I with you? We're all together. Okay, good. Thank you. I hit the wrong um so let's go into some popular uh, superstitions. I have assembled a, a, a lot of them here. Um, many, as you will see, come from sports. Um, any uh, competition, any situation in which people are in competition with other people, especially if they're in competition for scarce resources, uh, uh, lends itself to, to uh, magical uh, assistance. So uh, do you have a lucky charm? What makes it lucky? Uh, you carry it with you. It becomes part of you. It becomes identified with you. And if you lose it, my goodness, you're, you, you, you feel completely lost. Do you have a morning routine? Um, you know the old English expression to somebody who's grumpy or grouchy uh, or out of sorts. What happened? Did you get up on the wrong side of the bed this morning? Uh, that's exactly what that is directed at. We get into routines in the morning. Uh, and if we deviate from those routines, um, things just don't go right for us. We have a place in our cosmic, our interconnections, our network of interconnections. Um, I, I could go on with all with any of these. If you have questions about them, and here's the time for you to be thinking of your own superstitions, and you could jot them down and send them to Katie. When you go bowling, if you do, or play pool. When you let go of that ball, do you twist your body? Do you angle uh, 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 toward the direction that you want that ball to go? Do you feel that you are still connected to that ball? Yes, you do. This is the principle of body English. This is a fundamental um, magical uh, process that's really rooted in us based on the principle of contact. We are in contact with that ball we let it go. We still have some control over it because our essence is on that ball. Truly, we don't think this way, but that's what's going on. So you're, you know how to drive. You have your driver's license. Right now, you're a passenger. You know that the right foot goes on the gas and, 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 the, and the brake is right next to it. You know how the foot pedals work, but now you're a passenger. You're driving along, you're, the driver is distracted, chatting away with some, uh, on some topic and doesn't see that the cars in front are stopped. You see it and you jam your foot to the, to the brake on the floor, right? Um, you, you're, you're, you're doing it. Um, 
Have you had an experience like this? I was driving on Delaware Avenue past uh, Canisius College, um, and there was a line of, of, of parked cars on the right. You cannot see driveways because the cars are parked so tight. Suddenly, out of one of those driveways came a car right into my line of traffic. I, I, I was not, there was not time to brake. I went around him. Fortunately, no one was coming the other way. I made it. And I got to the traffic light at Maine and uh, Delavan, right? You know the spot. And then it hit me, the trembling, the, the adrenaline rush. Um, this, this is uh, um, the same kind of, of uh, essence that's going on with this guy who puts his brake, put his foot on the imaginary um, brake, brake pedal. Let's move along. You, your, your team can't win if you're not wearing their jersey. Uh, your your team can't win if you're not in a certain place where you were when they when they won the last time. All kinds of things like this. Uh, this last one is from my own experience. When I was in high school, I was a swimmer. I did well. I broke a, a school record. Uh, and on the day I I broke that record, I was wearing a certain suit suit of clothes when I went to my classes. On subsequent days when I competed. I made an effort to wear those same clothes, the very same clothes. I saved them, those, that set of clothes, that lucky set of clothes. What was I doing? On that day that I broke the record, things were going right for me. Uh, the network of interconnection, cosmic interconnections was, was, uh, was working well for me. And if I can do any little bit to reestablish that network, so, so much the better. It won't do any harm. And of course, it gives me a sense of control. It gives me a sense that I'm active in my own destiny. The clothes you wear during the day have nothing to do with your performance in the pool in the afternoon, right? No, wrong. Uh, everything is uh, interconnected. So this uh, these, this example comes from George Gamelch's famous uh, article on baseball magic, how a fellow established his own taboo. His wife always made him uh, cereal, coffee, and juice uh, in the morning, but one day she had a special treat for him, pancakes with real maple syrup. And on that day, he did the, the poorest, uh, he had the poorest showing in his game, that he could remember, he struck out and he followed, he, he uh, committed a number of errors in the field. He would never again eat pancakes on days that he was going to uh, compete. Um, the, your mascot, your mascot becomes part of you. It becomes your identity. Some guys from the opposite team came onto your campus last night and stole your mascot. My God, what are you gonna do? Your whole identity is gone. And principles of contact are evident in the fact that celebrities' possessions sell at auction for far, far more than they are inherently worth. We don't need a lot of examples of this, but I want you to think about it. How has an object changed because it's been handled by a celebrity? And look at these examples here. Um, um, Mark McGuire's 70th season home run ball. Cal Ripken Jr. Uh, uh, participated in 2,000 consecutive games and a ball he, he uh, hit uh, that on uh, his 2000th game is worth something. Barry Bonds 756 home run when he passed uh, Hank Aaron's world record, sold at auction this is true, folks. $186,750 was the sale price for that ball hit out of the park by Barry Bonds for home run number uh, 756 um, and so on. There are many, many more uh, examples like this. If you go to Steiner Sports, I'm sorry, I can't move my screen all of a sudden. I'm trying to get to the... Here we go. I'm not there yet. Uh, more sports examples from baseball. <clears throat> the new Yankee Stadium. Remember this case? 
um, a, a, a Red Sox jersey, David Ortiz's number 34, was buried in the foundations of the new Yankee Stadium, and word got out that it was there, and uh, $50,000 was the cost of jackhammering out that foundation and pulling out that sweatshirt that had been buried in there, truly. And this, this is all true. Uh, the curse of the jersey, look it up. The Gothamist on, on uh, April 14th of, of 2008. Derek Jeter retired shortly after, uh, shortly after uh, his, well, no, this is, sorry, not his retirement. That's coming up. His 3,000th hit, five gallons of dirt were scraped up from the, from the batter's box and the patch of ground where he go, goes back and forth uh, at playing shortstop. And those, um, the, the dirt is sold in, in little uh, parcels. Here is Derek Jeter's signed baseball on opening day of 2006. Uh, which Steiner Sports would sell for that price, uh, signed by by him. Um, he was declared the uh, MVP in the 2000 World Series. Uh, he signed this ball that was used in that game. You can have that one for $2,700. Uh, true, true. This is from uh, Steiner Sports. And here are some more, uh, many of them having to do with uh, with competition. Uh, also, this of infamous one um, back in the days of of, of of humiliation and desire for revenge following 9/11, um, the actions in in uh, the American actions in the Middle East and the infamous uh, uh, actions at Guantanamo um, uh, prison, um, the the Koran, which is fundamentally misunderstood by by Americans. Uh, it was the uh, subject of uh, a number of of uh, actions. Um, this story was false that a prisoner had uh, a, an interrogator had taken a prisoner's Bible and flushed it down a toilet page by page. That story was published. It went around the world. The story was absolutely false, but it caused all kinds of of uh, of of, uh, of a rage and uh, and uh, uh, mob violence in many Middle Eastern uh, uh, cities. Why? Um, you remember Pastor Jones? What is his name in that little village in Florida where he declared to the world that he's going to burn a pile of Korans in a public demonstration, um, and the uh, the people finally got outraged and said, "Don't do it. You don't know what you're doing." I think he did it actually, but. Um, yeah, that story also generated outrage of, uh, in the Muslim world. Why? Uh, the Quran is printed on paper, right? Made of paper and ink. But no, the Quran is not like the Bible. The Bible is a collection of writings about God, inspired by God for sure. But the Quran is the actual language of God himself. The Quran contains God's actual words. And of course, there's nothing dirtier, nothing lower than a toilet. Uh, and uh, so the symbolism is just, it's, it's just uh, uh, led, to, led to outrage. We uh, uh, Christians uh, and Jews uh, uh, have to construct a new way of thinking to, to understand it. Names are magical. I'm going to move along. If you know the name of some of a spirit, you can control the spirit. Uh, the beautiful example is uh, Rumpelstiltskin. You know that folk tale. Um, we place our right hand over our left chest when we recite the national, well, the Pledge of Allegiance, or we stand for the national anthem. Why? What's going on here? Right hand not left hand, right hand, and what's on the left side of the chest? The heart. The heart is an organ that pumps our blood, but of course the heart is more. The heart is symbolic. The heart is a, is a, is a poetic uh, and, and fundamentally human um, concept. 
your your logo showing your university or your corporation or your favorite team is right over your heart. It's not in the center. It's not on the right. It's right on on the left side where your heart is. Uh, at at four or six points in the day on September eleventh, um, bells ring and people stop for a minute or 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 longer. A moment of silence. What's going on? People believe that they are connecting to that actual event. Well, if you think about it, that really isn't isn't happening because what the, the 10 30 in the morning today is not the same time as 10 30 in the morning a year ago um and or a year before that that's why we have a leap year uh, to make up for for the time discrepancies nevertheless we do it what do we think we are doing uh, at those particular moments and i'm going to conclude here with some of these favorites uh, and I'll invite you if you want to stick around. Katie, how's your time? Can you stay a few more minutes? Um, I can, yep. And we have a couple questions too. Let, let's get through these, then I'll stop, okay? And we'll we'll uh, have some questions. Your Italian mother, grandmother, if you're any Italian people uh, in our audience, your grandmother probably believed in the malo, the malocchio, the the evil eye and she probably had a little horn a cornuto and it was probably made of gold uh, and whenever she heard foul language she would invoke the sign of the cross right uh, your grandfather hung a horseshoe points upward over the door of the house you should never open an umbrella in the house why not folks think about that you should not break a mirror why not? You should not step on a crack. Why not? And, and these are illustrative of those principles that I began our conversation with. Um, I explained already the cornuto, the power of the little horn. The horseshoe resembles horns. I, res I explained that already. The umbrella, the umbrella is designed for storm outside. An open umbrella protects you against storm, and it's been in contact with storm. Storm is disruption. Storm is unpleasant. Storm is danger, destruction, right? You bring the umbrella inside the house, you want to keep it closed. In fact, a lot of people will not bring an umbrella, even a furled umbrella, inside the house. It will stay in the vestibule in a special umbrella container. Um, if you open your umbrella in the house, you are bringing, potentially bringing in that disruption from outside. Every, in every culture in the world, the home is order, peace, um, predictability, comfort. The outside is unpredictability, unpredictability potential danger, uh, and potential destruction and so on and so on. Uh, domesticity uh, versus potential chaos and things that have been outside should stay outside. Uh, a hat is protection. You will never bring your hat inside the house and you certainly would not bring elements of the outside into the natal bed, in, uh, not natal bed, the marital bed, sorry. Um, where where life itself is is created right the 13 the taboo against 13 this is of course worth a separate talk on a separate day um the western taboo against 13 comes directly from the christian story of the last supper of jesus there were 13 people at that table the next day was the crucifixion um and uh that's really it uh, the next day was a Friday, uh, and if Friday is the 13th, then you've got a double whammy. So I'm going to say we're done here, but let's uh, see if there are some questions. I've repeated mm -hmm. my email address and my uh, mobile phone, and I remind you that this talk is has been recorded and 
probably tomorrow and thereafter you can access it. Uh, Katie, did you give us the uh, website? Or will you do? I didn't yet, um, but our University Express page is erie.gov slash University Express. And you can look for this probably about Monday is when I'll be able to have it posted. Oh, and good. so okay. we do have, we do have a couple of folks who called in. So if you just want to read off your email address and your phone number, just so they could capture it, please. Oh, sorry. Not everyone is, is watching. Okay. P Stevens, P S T E V E N S at buffalo.edu. And I'll get that immediately. I don't, there, there's no other uh, email address. My, Cell phone number, if you want a conversation, area code 716-247-3824. I'll be glad to uh, answer questions. And if I don't have the answers, I'll try to direct you to where you can find them. Okay, thank you, Phil. Um, so just quickly, a couple of the superstitions that came through, um, the follow through in golf or tennis, um, lucky pennies. And, Wait a minute. Um, the, reference from, what was that about follow through? Just the the superstition of the follow through in golf or tennis. I don't know what that means. Okay. Um, maybe we could have that person elaborate on that if they wanted to. Um, okay. Lucky pennies being superstitious. Um, and, yeah. You can make anything lucky. Uh, and people do. Uh, any uh, coin, um, any uh, shiny pebble, uh, smooth piece of wood, something that feels nice in your pocket, it feels comfortable, it feels uh, uh, reassuring to you. Um, most likely, that item was associated with some piece of good fortune. And you want to keep that good fortune, just as I uh, assigned good fortune to my clothes, but you, it's not not essential. It's something that over time becomes you. It's yours. It's part of of you, um, and you feel good when you have it. You feel assured. This is one of the functionalist explanations of magic. It gives you a little bit of control and a little bit of confidence uh, in a unpredictable. Uh, world. So the magic pen can uh, uh, fit those uh, criteria, uh, but the best explanation is to ask the person himself or herself, why is why do you consider that lucky? Let's see what they say. Did it bring That's you before? Huh? Okay, well, I've got um, a couple questions here for you. And the first one we'll start with is, are you saying that all religion is just superstition? Absolutely not. Uh, I'm talking about magic, the principles of magic, according to the six principles that I've set down. They are intertwined with religion. They are not um, separate. Uh, early philosophers and anthropologists separated magic from religion. Religion was, re was described as or defined as the worship of the establishment of a um, relationship with supernatural beings. Beings, and that's important. We call them spirits uh, or gods. Uh, mostly they are considered up above us. We consider God, uh, the angels, God's attendants and God's messengers up above. Um, uh, we consider the spirits of the dead may be in cemeteries or they may be in heaven. Um, those are beings, spiritual beings. We believe that they understand us and we, we can relate to them and we have a contractual mutual relationship with them. The principles of magic are separate. They do not involve spirits. Although Fraser said you could control spirits by magical means, I didn't go into that because that gets confusing. We should understand that spirits are always believed to be sentient, sentient and willful. They can think and they can make decisions. 
and they may choose not to obey you. The Bible uh, uh, warns us about that. The forces of nature are dumb. They are robotic. Uh, they respond to magic and they respond easily if the magic is trying to enhance them. They respond unpredictably if the magic is trying to deflect them, to make them go in a different direction. But magic is, it, conceptually, magic is separate from religion, but in terms of religious ritual uh, and religious belief, a lot of it is magical. I hope that helps in the answering that question. Yeah, thank you for that explanation, Phil. Um, the next question we have is, since you mentioned that magical thinking is natural and innate, is it basically a prop for human beings to cope with uncertainty and chaos that may exist around them? Excellent. Thank you for that. <laughs> that that's, um, that's a good summary of um, a couple of my main points. So is there a question there? Um, it looks like it was just a clarifying question. Good, good, good. Yeah, that's very nicely, nicely said. Okay, awesome. Um, somebody said that they believe that symbol that you were talking about that we couldn't quite remember the name is the mezuzah, if I'm not mispronouncing it. Thank that. you very much, mezuzah. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm talking to you okay. without notes and my memory is aging. I am an Erie County senior citizen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh, you for that. Oh. Yeah, Mazuza. That's You're the best. Um, so another question we have is: Do you believe in astrology? No. That takes care okay. of that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Um, so that person with the talking about the follow through that was my mistake. They were talking in reference to the continuation of movement. So still in having that connection with your follow through in tennis or bowling giving examples of that. Um, yeah, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I can't respond. I, I, I play tennis and I was a bowler um, and I appreciate skill and often that follow through is part of a well-controlled stroke, but I don't know how it can relate to a superstition. Sorry, I can't, I can't deal, I can't handle that one. <laughs> and that may also be me not explaining that well. So um, if anybody else has any other questions or comments, Bill, we've received a lot of praise, great presentation. Thank you for sharing such interesting work. I enjoyed it. Magical thinking has always kept, keep me, um, my observation while traveling. Um, so really wonderful. Thank you for all of your time and your expertise and sharing it with us. We need we need distractions, don't we, during this time of COVID? And this is the hottest uh, day of our season so far here in Erie County. And I hope you're all in an air conditioned uh, place. Thank you very much for joining us and for being so patient. I'm, we've been here now. Katie and I have been on for almost two hours together. We mm -hmm. do for uh, about an hour and a half, haven't we? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Look forward to doing it again.